everybody. Uh, welcome back to another Polymesh AMA. Looks like we're good on the live stream. See a bunch of people joining in uh, in YouTube here. So yeah, looks like we're uh, we're all good to go. Um, a few things before we get started. If you aren't subscribed to the channel, subscribe right now. Uh, you can actually only comment on our YouTube channel if you are subscribed uh, and you're actually not truly part of the Meshi Mafia until you subscribe. So make sure you do that uh, and then you'll be part of the Meshi Mafia. So uh, as always, uh, thank you to everybody for all the amazing questions. A ton of questions came in. We've got a bunch of different categories here. Uh, we've got Polymesh private questions. We've got Polymesh, tokenization, node operators, the association, business development, product development, stable coins, uh, and the community. So I think we'll, uh, we'll just jump in here. It's April 11th, 2024, uh, time for our Q1. Polymesh AMA, let's uh, let's do it. And uh, yeah, throughout, throughout the entire AMA, feel free to ask any questions in the comment box on YouTube. Uh, I might be able to get to some of those. Uh, if I see some good questions, we can uh, answer those at the end as well. But yeah, let's do it. Uh, Polymesh Private. Okay, can Polymesh Private be used in closed networks by institutions such as banks and major financial institutions? Yes, that's, uh, that's the whole point of Polymesh Private. Uh, it's the entire strategy. Almost all of the tokenization that's take, taken place to this point is still done on private blockchains, and we want to capture that market. So today, people are using JP Morgan's Onyx. They're using Canton, uh, Hyperledger, R3. Uh, and then what's happening is we're finally starting to hear more and more institutions actually say that they understand that public blockchains are the future, but they're just still not there yet from a compliance point of view, uh, from a use case point of view. And so they're still experimenting with private blockchains. And so what's happening now is they're using those blockchains I mentioned, those private blockchains, and then they're going to decide at some point, whether it's six months, a year, two years from now, whenever, when they want to move to a public blockchain. And so if they're using one of those solutions, where are they going to migrate? You know, maybe Polymesh, but it might be somewhere else. And so a way better approach that we've realized is, well, let's embed the Polymesh private blockchain infrastructure into their tech stack. And then when they're ready to move to a public blockchain, they just have to change their node endpoint Instead of writing to the Polymesh private blockchain instance they have, they can write to the public Polymesh blockchain. And so that's ultimately the approach that we're taking right now is how do we embed Polymesh technology into an institution's infrastructure? And Polymesh private is a great way that, that we found to do that. So that's the idea. Uh, banks, major financial institutions using Polymesh private. Next question, what has been the response to Polymesh Private? It's been really positive. We've had a few meetings with some major institutions already. Uh, yeah, it's been really positive all around the board. Can you share the names of any companies interested in using Polymesh Private? Uh, if not, can you share the number? Uh, I can't share either of those today. Um, what I can share, there is one company already using it. Um, we haven't gone public with the information yet. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to do that soon. You know, I know everyone always wants you know when news, when news. Um, a lot of things have to fall into place until we're able to make those kinds of public announcements. Um, and so hopefully we'll be able to do that with the one company that's that's actually already using it today. Is PolyX used by Polymesh Private? So it is not. Um, so that's an important distinction. And so Polymesh Private, just to backtrack and give a bit more high level overview of what Polymesh Private is exactly. So there's the Polymesh public blockchain. That's a public blockchain. It is permission. So people have to pass an identity check to use it. Uh, everybody knows about the licensed uh, financial entities that are node operators. And so it's a public blockchain. People can create smart contracts. They can create tokens using the native tools on the Polymesh blockchain. They can build tools like DEXs. Someone could build an exchange. Someone could uh, create a broker dealer that's integrated, uh, an ATS that's integrated. People can do all that kind of fun stuff on the public blockchain and interact with other parties. Polymesh Private is a private instance of the Polymesh blockchain. So a bank actually takes the code we give them they pay a license. They say, hey, I will give you money uh, every month or whatever the case may be. You give us the Polymesh private code, and I will run that inside my own infrastructure in a private way. And so it's totally separate from the Polymesh public blockchain. I know that I, I've seen a few questions, uh, whether on Discord. And right now, if you're not a member of Polymesh Discord, go join the Discord right now. Uh, but I've seen a bunch of questions on the Polymesh Discord, you know, how connected are, are Polymesh and Polymesh Private? Does Polymesh Private feed into transactions settling on the public blockchain? It's, they're totally separate. And so this is really just where banks and institutions are today in their blockchain and tokenization journey. They're still using private blockchains. They still want to have that comfort in knowing that they're running the tech on their own servers or you know whatever their own cloud infrastructure that they use inside their own closed 
walled environment. And so we're giving that to them. Uh, you know, we think we build the best technology in the whole entire world as far as layer ones for tokenization. Let's give banks that, that great technology we've been working on for the last you know, seven years now. Let's give them that great technology in a private form that they can run inside their own infrastructure so that they're, that they're going to use it. They're going to tokenize, you know, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of products. And then let's hope that they migrate over to the public polymesh blockchain when they're ready. Um, but yeah, so that was a very long-winded uh, recap of what is polymesh private. But the question is, is polyx used by polymesh private? Uh, so no. So, so that private instance of polymesh private uh, that an institution is running, they can elect to have token fees if they want, um, but they can also elect for no token fees. And so that's just a model that a lot of institutions still favor. Um, we are finally starting to see some positive things where banks and institutions are looking at, you know, how can we actually touch Ethereum to use Ethereum transactions? How can we touch PolyX to use PolyMesh transaction? Um, and so we are getting there uh, slowly but surely. Um, a lot of companies are still using intermediaries for that, uh, or, you know, a, a digital uh, broker dealer or, or kind of like tokenization license broker dealer ATS. Um, but yeah, we are getting there, but still a lot of banks just want to, you know, pay dollars to some company, license technology, and run that on, on their own infrastructure. What is the pricing for Polynesh Private? Uh, right now, uh, in terms of what is the pricing, drop us an email. Uh, if you qualify uh, through our sales process, uh, we're happy to talk about pricing. Soon after the Polynesh Private announcement, BlackRock created a $100 million fund on a public network. This news, I'm assuming the news of, of Polynesh Private, is a contradiction. ETH has a network effect on its side. What are your plans to capture the market? So yeah, I mean, I think one thing that's really important to note about the BlackRock fund on Ethereum, that's very positive. And it's very positive for Polymesh, right? And so I think I, I talked about this uh, in Discord recently. In 2017, you know, no one knew if tokenization was actually going to be a real thing. No one knew if banks were actually going to use this stuff. 2019, uh, you know, Bitcoin goes down from $20,000 to $3,000. ETH goes from whatever it was, a thousand something down to $80. $80. Um, everyone goes, okay, yeah, great. I don't have to pay attention to tokenization anymore. I don't have to pay attention to crypto. Blockchain is dead. Bitcoin is dead. All of these things are stupid. I'm so glad that I, you know, didn't make my bank do any of this kind of stuff because all this, all this tech was worthless. What BlackRock has done on Ethereum proves that this technology is actually useful. It's viable. It's going to be here for the long term, um, and that's a very, very good thing for Polymesh. Um, and so just, you know, I want to make sure that that's very well understood by the Polymesh community and by just anyone else interested in tokenization. You know, this proves that this technology has staying power and there's going to be a number of companies, a number of blockchains, a number of protocols that end up winning uh, in the space. And, and we believe Polymesh is one of those. Um, but so, yeah, uh, what are the plans to capture market? Well, the market, Right. So in the question, it's a hundred million dollar fund. That's zero dollars in terms of track five. Like no one cares about a hundred dollars or sorry, a hundred million dollars. No one cares about a hundred dollars or a hundred million dollars even. Right. People care about billions of dollars. They care about trillions of dollars. Um, and so the billions of dollars that are being tokenized, those are actually still on private blockchains. Um, and so we do believe that the majority of the market is still going to be on private blockchains for, you know, whatever call it the next six months, two years, two years. Um, so we want to capture that market and then we want to get them to migrate over to the public blockchain side when they're ready. Um, and there are still a lot of issues with using a permissionless network. And so in actually my uh, in my announcement that we did uh, for Polynesh Private at Digital Asset Summit in London a couple weeks ago, I touched on what the Bank of International Settlement said, which is, and so I, I have the quote here just to make sure I don't get it wrong. Um, so they were looking at permissionless networks and if crypto assets should be treated in a specific way on a permissionless network. And so here's what they said. They said, the committee has completed this review and concluded that the use of permissionless blockchains gives rise to a number of unique risks, some of which cannot be sufficiently mitigated at present. Some of the most significant risks stem from the network's reliance on third parties to carry out basic operations. And so what the conclusion comes to is that there are infrastructure risk add-ons that authorities can activate based on any observed weakness in the infrastructure on which crypto assets are based. And it effectively says that any asset on a permissionless number cannot cate cate be categorized as group one capital. And so anybody who like knows the BIS, knows, knows like Basel standards, like um, knows what group one capital is, and you want to have all of your assets as group one capital because group one capital 
assets have the lowest uh, requirements in terms of what you have to hold on your balance sheet. And so like in, in layman's terms, you can't have a crypto asset on a permissionless blockchain in group one, which means it's either group two or something else. And so you have to actually hold more capital on your balance sheet because BIS says, well, this thing that you're doing is very risky. You have to mitigate that by holding a bunch more capital. Um, and we're actually going to charge you a bunch more um, in, in terms of like how you run your day-to-day -day operations because what you're doing is very risky. And so we still feel like permissionless blockchains, the use of smart contracts by random third parties uh, is not the way to go. And it's not the way that banks uh, see this playing out ultimately. And so that, that's how we think we're going to capture the market, right? Providing a private solution today and providing an API-driven blockchain called Polymesh, where a lot of the functionality is built into the base layer of the chain. And so that, that reliance on third parties to carry out basic operations is a huge thing there from the BIS, where they're talking about two different things. They're talking about the validators of the network, where, right, like on, on Ethereum, let's, let's take the, the BlackRock fund, for example. On Ethereum, BlackRock, you know, they tell their... Uh, $25 million accredited authorized party, hey, make a trade of this fund. And then the, the trade is validated by a node operator in Iran, you know, like that's something that can happen with that fund. Um, and then on top of that, the smart contracts are from Securitize, which, you know, let's say Securitize is a great company. Um, but what a lot of companies are using in the space, especially on Ethereum, are, are, are third party smart contracts by, you know, five guys in a GitHub working on the ERC 1400 standard that we event, that we initially uh, spearheaded. And so those kinds of things are really concerning for banks and really concerning for regulators where you say, okay, well, what are the critical linchpins uh, of your financial infrastructure? And you say, oh, well, we don't really know it's a decentralized network. You know, that doesn't really fly very well. And, you know, maybe that will change in the future and, and we get to a place where, you know, that kind of stuff is, is allowed and accepted. Um, but, you know, just the world is not there right right now. Banks are not there right now. Um, regulators are not there right now, right now. So we still feel like the permission network that's public is the way of the future. That's API driven, not smart contract driven. Um, and private blockchains are still where, where banks wanna do the majority of their tokenizations today. Because you can only have a certain amount of your assets as not group one capital. Um, and so that $100 million fund on BlackRock, you know, I'd be, you know, I hope I hope it grows to a massive fund, um, but ultimately banks cannot put a huge amount of their capital as uh, non-group one uh, capital assets because they just have to have uh, higher capital requirements, which you know makes the whole entire point of blockchain sort of pointless, right? A, a huge reason why blockchain exists is because you bring down the cost of things, you make things more efficient, but if you have to hold higher capital on your balance sheet, that really totally offsets any of the gains you can get from blockchain. So that's one of the ways that we've been thinking about that and, and how we plan to capture the market there. Okay, let's go to Polymesh. What incentive is there for an institution to move from Polymesh private to Polymesh? And so I, I think I touched on it a bit, but you know the costs and fees are different. Um, and so right, some institutions do want to have that licensing model where they pay a set amount of fees per month, but some are finally interested in exploring the model of what does it look like when I pay all the extra transaction fees and I don't necessarily engage in a type of specific contract with an entity like the Polymesh Association? What does that look like? And so they're starting to explore that. Uh, access to other features, access to specific tools that they might not have built, lending markets, uh, decentralized exchanges, transparency, potentially more clients that are global in nature. Um, so a global capital pool, and just moving forward with the industry. If the majority of assets start moving onto public blockchains, no one wants to get stuck behind with their kind of siloed database that doesn't connect to anything else. And so we think that just naturally that progression is happening. Um, and we do feel pretty positive about that for the future. When you collaborated or conducted a proof of concept with a financial institution, what was the most important request? What challenge was hard to solve? I think one of the interesting things here uh, was how we had to change how we dealt with metadata. So I think we had like some really basic, very small field where uh, someone could inject a small amount of metadata into a token. And that institution that we worked with, everyone, I, I think, um, or whoever asked this question, I assume is talking about the top 10 stock exchange that we did a proof of concept with. And so what they had us do is, is actually change uh, the metadata field in, in the token. 
Um, so they actually injected a, a lot of information into there. And we just had no idea that, that an institution would want to do something like that. But that was part of the whole reason why they found blockchain interesting was you can actually make all of this information about the asset itself much more visible to all the parties that might be involved in a trade. Whereas, you know, previously that information information might be in a lawyer's filing cabinet and someone might have to actually call the bank on a telephone or, you know, send them an email, obviously. Um, but they might have to literally call the bank and say, hi, can you send me all of the information about this carbon credit? Um, but now someone just goes on a block explorer like Subscan and checks the information there, which, which is publicly available. And so that was a really interesting thing. Um, challenges that are hard to solve. I still think the main one is, is how does cash work on a blockchain? Um, a lot of banks, a lot of financial institutions are still really uncomfortable using stable coins. Um, and so using cash in a settlement where you can actually make some type of atomic swap where cash hits, hits a bank account, payment receipt get, gets created, payment receipt gets thrown on chain, securities move from wallet A to wallet B. That's that's still, I think, one of the main sticking points for a lot of people. And so, yeah, how does cash work on a blockchain is still one of the main problems. Um, and then transparency, right? Like we feel like transparency is one of the great benefits of blockchain. A lot of other people do as well, but it's transparency in the negative of, will I potentially expose my client data over time, right? And so that, that's, again, a huge concern for banks, which is if I have my client and they're 0x123ABC and they're constantly trading, can someone else eventually piece together who that client is and then potentially you know, front run an earnings report or figure out what they're doing? Um, and so that's why a huge thing we're working on is uh, a lot of zero knowledge technology um, in terms of how we can actually obfuscate a lot of that information, not, not even necessarily just a trade, but uh, like all the information around the trade, which parties are trading, what's the price of the asset, how many units are moving from wallet A to wallet B. So all that stuff is really exciting uh, that we're working on in terms of how can we use zero knowledge to actually make banks more comfortable with using public blockchains because they can hide the information that they need to hide while keeping transparent the things they want to keep transparent. Can you summarize the recent changes made to staking emissions? Yes, I can. Uh, so the recent change didn't have any impact on the current emissions. And so what was going to happen previously before we made that change is we have this, this diagram, I'm sure people have seen it on the Polymesh website, people constantly talk about it in Discord, you know, what's, what's the API for staking? Um, and so how it functioned previously was based on how many, how many PolyX are currently staked, um, and then also how many are staked on the node operator that you're using, and what's the current supply of PolyX. And so roughly, let's say before the previous change would have been made, uh, staking emissions would be about 102 million PolyX per year. But what previously we had set up was, okay, once supply equals 1 billion or greater, it, new emissions are automatically 140 million a year. And so, you know, we looked at that. And, and when I say we, it's, it was mostly Francis uh, who looked at that, shout out Francis, um, where he went, there shouldn't be this huge jump going from essentially 100 million to 140 million, just because we decided you know, two years ago that once supply equals 1 billion, uh, new emissions should be 140 million per year. So we said, okay, instead of new supply equals 140 million per year, now it equals a maximum of 140 million per year, but still follows that previous calculation. Um, and so it can be lower than 140 million per year, but a maximum of 140 million. And so uh, right now, as I mentioned, it's about 102 million. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what it is today. Is there any library with business cases available on developments with PolyMesh or any hands-on articles on tokenization with PolyMesh? And so there's, there's lots of information on our blog, uh, tons of information on our site. What, what we've uh, still been waiting for is that start to finish tokenization process with a high quality asset that we're, we're excited to talk about. Um, and that's finally coming very, very soon. Um, you know, it's been a very long haul. Uh, it's been a lot of work uh, from our team in a lot of different areas getting to that point. Um, and so there have been assets issued on Polymesh. I think we're at 37 tokens right now. Um, but that start to finish, really high quality asset that we're really excited to talk about where we completely dive into all the details that, that will be coming pretty soon. Uh, and so on tokenization, uh, could Ondo or Rio use Polymesh to tokenize assets? Um, so, so I did look into this. Ondo, yeah, absolutely. Ondo, uh, if, if people aren't familiar, Ondo is a company. They're a fund, I believe, is what they're regulated as. So Ondo buys treasuries, takes those treasuries, puts them on blockchains for people to purchase. 
And so I believe they've done that on Ethereum. They've done that on a few other blockchains. We actually talked to Ondo at Digital Assets Summit uh, in London a few weeks ago. Talked about using Polymesh. Yeah, it's absolutely something that they could do in the future. Um, for Rio, uh, you know, I did some very high level uh, looking at Rio's website. It looks like they're a layer one blockchain. So, so I wouldn't uh, guess that Rio would want to use Polymesh since they already have a layer one blockchain. But, you know, who knows what could happen in terms of collaborations and, and interoperability and things like that. Do you anticipate security tokens created on Polymesh will be traded on public exchanges? Yes, absolutely. Uh, that's the ultimate long-term goal is, is Polymesh is the base layer of settlement for all financial securities. And so that's a very long-term goal um, and something that, you know, that's what keeps me excited about Polymesh is, is getting to that long-term goal. But ultimately, initially, it, it's still going to be, you know, largely private exchanges, largely um, still kind of siloed based on whichever platform is issuing the assets and is able to trade the assets. So, you know, inside a broker-dealer, inside of an ATS, uh, things of that nature, where... And the, and the reason why I say that is, is largely due to how well entrenched the existing technology is inside of, you know, the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, for example. I think I've talked about this previously where, you know, the markets were going after, you know, they're stuck together by duct tape. Uh, there's technology from, you know, 50 years ago. There's literally pieces of paper and lawyers filing cabinets. Um, and there's not a lot of transparency. Whereas, you know, when you go to your broker and you click buy on the NASDAQ, you know, that works pretty well. Um, and so, and, and it's, you know, pretty well-worn path to go from, you know, company, raise money, go on the NASDAQ, uh, company, borrow money from, uh, you know, Goldman Sachs puts together your, your debt funding round. And then, you know, Goldman Sachs are the people who run that technology inside their own, in, uh, inside their own infrastructure and they're, you know, who decides who can sell by literally calling people on the phone. And they kind of like that business model. Um, so private markets where assets are much less less liquid, much less transparent, we still think that's that's the first uh, and most vital use case for securities. This is a great one. Uh, has any outreach been done with Securitize? With the BlackRock uh, Build or Biddle Fund, uh, they have cemented themselves as an industry leader in tokenization. I'm wondering if someone from Securitize almost asked this question. Uh, while their current operations focus on Ethereum, they claim to be chain agnostic and their CEO has said Ethereum needs explicit acceptance of tokens and improved privacy features to remain viable. These are two features Polymesh offers. How do you plan to make this more widely known? Um, so yeah, absolutely. It was really cool to see Carlos uh, talking about how the issue with their fund being bombarded with you know Tornado Cash, uh, uh, ETH, um, and a bunch of tokens. I think, uh, <laughs> I think the funniest uh, one that I saw is this one account on Ethereum uh, called Big Dick Larry .eth keeps sending the account like 0.001 ETH, um, which is actually quite funny. Um, and, and you know, I've I've, I've talked to Blackheart about this. I've talked to Securitize about this. You know, that that is that is an issue that they see. Um, and it is really it was really cool to see that uh, Carlos mentioned that um, publicly. And so yeah, we know Securitize well. I've I've known Carlos since 2017. Right in 2017, it was pretty much. Securitize and Polymath were the two only companies that existed trying to do this kind of thing. Um, so yeah, Securitize, we don't have any integration with them now, but you know, absolutely nothing stopping us from doing that in the future. We'd absolutely love if that was the case. Uh, I think I skipped one here. Yeah, it's difficult to be everything to everyone. Are you focusing on specific industries to tokenize? If not, should you be? Um, and so yeah, it's a great question. I would, I would say most blockchains are actually focused on everything. Right, Ethereum is focused on everything. Solana is focused on everything. Um, Avalanche is focused on everything. Um, and so for us, we're actually only focused on financial securities. And so I would say that's pretty hyper-focused in the layer one blockchain world. Um, and so just in terms of how nascent the space is, we really don't know where that first thing that's going to pop off will be. Um, is it real estate? You know, Potentially, is it private equity funds? Is it carbon credits? Um, and so really ensuring that we can create a blockchain that isn't necessarily just for one asset and keeping it more general um, so that you know, a token is a token and there's not really necessary like a real estate token or a carbon credit token. Keeping that kind of infrastructure positions us well for the long term. Um, and, and we do have specific focuses. I'd say probably those three I just mentioned are, are kind of the three we are very focused on. Um, but yeah, assigning ourselves to just one very specific niche, um, I don't think makes sense uh, right now, just because you know we're, it's still a very nascent market and we need uh, one of those use cases to really shine. Uh, and we're you know going after those as aggressively as we can. 
how does one become an owner of a tokenized asset? Let's say I own a real estate token on Polymesh and want to sell it. How does that work? It completely depends on the platform uh, where you bought the asset. And so, as I mentioned, some platforms will require you to go through, you know, potentially their KYC process. Uh, they might have a custodial model where they are actually holding onto the tokens for you. Some might actually just have the tokens freely available on something like a decentralized exchange. Um, where they say anyone who fits a certain criteria, who has certain attest attestations from an attestation provider we uh, trust, they can buy this token. And so it totally depends on the specific offering. It depends on the specific issuer. It depends on, depends on the platform, um, jurisdiction. There, there's a bunch of different nuances where, where you know I can't say this is how you buy and sell an asset on Polymesh. It completely depends uh, on a number of different criteria. Uh, moving on to node operators. Uh, is TigerWit still a node operator and considered a financially regulated entity? Uh, yeah, so um, I think uh, I saw another question about TigerWit as well, where someone sent us the wrong website. Um, but yeah, TigerWit was actually sold uh, and rebranded as Calico Capital, um, C-A-L-I-C-O Capital. Um, so if you if you Google TigerWit Calico, um, you can definitely find the article. Um, they still have their financial license. So uh, yep, they're, they're still an operator and they're still a financially regulated entity. What safeguards are in place to constantly re-verify node operators akin to the meticulous financial due diligence processes commonplace in the industry? Uh, so we check node operators, we do a KYB process on them. Uh, we check their licenses uh, when they onboard. Then we also check them regularly. So yeah, very similar to what someone would be familiar with in traditional finance. Moving on to the association. Who are the other... Polymesh Association members and what are their roles? Uh, so there's 18 full-time contributors right now. Uh, you can go check the website uh, to go see uh, some of the leaders. Uh, so there's myself, there's Will Bass Jones, who leads business development. There's uh, Nick Cafaro, who leads product development, Adam Doso, who leads tech, and then Francis, who leads uh, developer uh, outreach in the ecosystem. And so, you know, we have a bunch of other contributors, you know, they're on the dev team primarily. There's also some in marketing, uh, some in finance. Um, you know, I'm, sure you can potentially find them on LinkedIn if you want to go uh, take a peek, um, but I'm not going to like list out every single person uh, who's at the Polymesh Association. Here. Is the Polymesh Association still considered a not-for-profit with the release of Polymesh Private? So yes, it is. Um, so not-for-profit doesn't necessarily mean you, you don't take in any revenue. Um, it just means that you ultimately at the end of the day are not-for-profit. So the, the, the goal is not necessarily to earn profit. It's to, you know, provide a service, um, um, and build a blockchain and, and provide you know that that, uh, that great technology for for the rest of humanity essentially, and so potentially in the future you know maybe there's some kind of subco that we develop or some kind of different structure um, for Polymesh Private specifically. Um, but right now you know we've, we've spoken to our lawyers uh, more times than than I wish we ever have. Um, but yeah, there's no need to change anything today. Would the Polymesh Association consider paying for pilot projects if it allowed for more favorable disclosure terms? Um, so, I mean, we do provide grants today. Um, a number of companies have taken us up on those offers. Uh, I think we've published a few grants that we've given out, um, but there's even more that we still have yet to publish. Um, and so there generally is language in those grants uh, around marketing. And, and I'm assuming this question is related to, you know, why can't we say who that top 10 stock exchange was that we worked with. And, you know, ultimately, sometimes that's just how financial institutions are. Um, you know, we've done that one POC with them. They didn't want to market it. That's fine. They didn't want their competitors to know what they're working on. Um, and, you know, totally reasonable, totally understandable that they that they want to do that. Next time, hopefully that won't be the case. Um, but And, you know, we, we are definitely putting a stronger emphasis on that in the initial discussions with these kinds of entities where, you know, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for people... To, to know what kind of institutions we're working with. We're, we're, we're looking to get the word out. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's something that is very important to us. Um, it's not always important for, for big financial institutions, um, but, you know, impressing upon that, uh, impressing upon them, you know, what's important to us, I think uh, should work out better in the future. Business development. Uh, could Will Vaz Jones do an AMA? Uh, yeah, for sure. I'll, uh, I'll ask him if he wants to, and we'll, uh, we'll see what he says. What are the most important business development fronts Polymesh is working on? I think number one, you know, a lot of the stuff we can't go into too too great of detail um, because again, you know, under NDAs, working with working with financial institutions, um, they don't necessarily want news to get out before it's ready. Um, getting more assets on chain is what we're working on. That's the number one thing. That that is what we care about. Is how do we get the the TVL that everybody loves to talk about? How do we get the total value locked of assets on Polymesh to go up? And so. 
one, one exciting development in that area is, is something we work on with, with a real estate company and with a digital ATS. Um, and so an ATS is an alternative trading system, which is a specific license in the United States uh, given to, to alternative trading systems. Um, and so, you know, I, I can't talk much more about that um, right now, but that's something that we're working on that, you know, we think is going to be very, very exciting. Is Polymesh focusing on any particular jurisdiction for business development, South Korea, for example? And so, you know, same sort of similar question to is there a specific asset or, or use case that we're focused on? And, you know, we are focused on some jurisdictions more than others, um, but the industry is just still so nascent where we don't really know where things are going to happen next. Um, you know, I'd say in general, we're, we're largely focused on the United States, Europe, South Korea is one, um, Singapore is another one, Hong Kong. Um, I'd say those are probably the main jurisdictions we're focused on, um, but still, you know, no idea what's going to happen. I'd say the U.S. is exciting um, because that's just where a lot of boundary pushing happens in the world of technology. Um, Europe's exciting because of uh, Mika, where they have some clear regulations around what's going on. And then, and then Asia as well has some clear reg regulations, specifically in South Korea on, you know, what is a security, what is a security token? What are the rules around that? And so that's pretty exciting for us. Has any thought been given to hiring employees on the ground in favorable jurisdictions to help push the product? Yes. Pushing P very important. Um, and so, I mean, my thoughts, you know, with how global the world is and, and especially since COVID, you know, the amount of comfort and acceptance of video calling, you know, we don't really feel the need to do that specifically today. Um, and for example, you know, there's two companies in North Korea, KDAC and BDAX, both regulated custodians that we're working with. I've still never been to Korea. No one on our team has ever even been to Korea once. Um, and so a lot of business development still happens, you know, over video call, a lot happens at conferences. Um, and so seeing people face to face is great and it does help. Um, but we still haven't necessarily thought something like, we need to hire a South Korean um, or we need to hire someone in Hong Kong or we need to hire someone uh, in France, for example. Um, you know, we have people all around the world. Our Adam Dosa, our, our head of blockchain, CTO, uh, he's in the UK. Uh, we've got people in Ireland, uh, Hungary, China, uh, Argentina, Brazil. Uh, I'm in New York. A lot of our teams in Canada. You know, so really all around the world, we have things pretty well covered. Um, but yeah, nothing specific where we've thought we have to have someone in a, in a specific jurisdiction yet, um, but you know that might happen soon. Let's so got uh, product development. Uh, can we hear from the product development team? Uh, yes, you can. Um, you know we don't have them chained up or anything. Um, and so uh, Nick's on Discord all the time. Uh, you can find him. I think his, his uh, handle is Mesh Product. Francis is on Discord all the time. Uh, you can sometimes find uh, Robert in there. You can find Adam on there as well. Um, and so get in the discord, join the discord right now, go to polymesh.network slash discord uh, to join. Um, I think there's about, there's at least a couple thousand people in there right now. Um, so yeah, join the Meshy Mafia, subscribe to the YouTube channel, join the discord, follow us on uh, X. And then that's uh, how you become a member of the Meshy Mafia. But yeah. I mean, uh, I think, uh, I think Adam's written a couple blog pieces recently. I think Robert's written one. Um, and so yeah, happy to, happy to make them more visible so that people can, uh, and get a get a taste of the technology straight from the horse's mouth, as it were. Uh, next question as well: Can Nick Cafaro or Adam Dosa do an AMA? And so, you know, people have asked uh, in this in this uh, AMA round of questioning: Can Will do an AMA? Can Nick do an AMA? Can Adam do an AMA? So, you know, it sounds like the people aren't aren't uh, feeling uh, Graham's AMAs anymore, and you know, totally understandable. Uh, I've been around for a while, um, but yeah, happy happy to arrange that. Uh, we can have uh, we can have Nick or Adam or Will do an AMA. Maybe we'll do something uh, different, like an interview or something with them. But yeah, um, again, go to the Discord. That's how we figure out a lot of these issues. You know, what should we do next uh, from a marketing standpoint? What kind of videos should we put out? Go to the Discord. Let us know. Uh, actually, maybe we'll do a vote if people who people want to do the next AMA. Me, Will, Nick, or Adam. I'm guessing Adam might win, but we'll see. Um, yeah, go do that. Um, we'll uh, we'll have that soon. What are the most important technological developments Polymesh is working on? And so this is where I wish uh, Adam was doing the AMA, but I have some good points here. Um, so really pushing the limits on zero knowledge proofs uh, for confidential assets, that's a big one. And so we're going to be releasing V1 of that on Polymesh private first. And then once it's been battle tested on Polymesh private in let's call it, you know, a safer environment um, where it's a specific bank, uh, they have, you know, their specific controls on assets. They have specific controls on who can see what's going on. 
Once we battle tested in that environment, then we're going to move that over to PolyMesh. And I think that's how a few features might work, um, where in that very closed controlled environment, it's much easier to sort of release something um, before we release it into the wild um, on PolyMesh. Because once something's on PolyMesh, you know, anybody can use it. Um, and, you know, if, uh, if that hasn't been battle tested thoroughly, um, then, you know, there could be issues that could arise. So we really want to make sure that stuff is built really well. Of course, we always audit um, code that we put on the public blockchain. Um, we get third-party auditing done. And we do battle test it extensively internally, but there's nothing like a real live environment uh, to really test things and see where uh, maybe we can make things better. And so confidentiality, zero knowledge proofs, um, zero knowledge tech going on Polymesh private, and then hopefully migrating as Polymesh shortly after. We've also started brainstorming and interoperability. Um, so both in terms of bridging assets and then cross-chain atomic transfers. And so one thing that we've spoken to actually a few firms about is how do you have, let's say, cash on Ethereum, like USDC, or cash on Solana, USDC, USDT, whatever. Um, how do you conduct a transaction there between wallets and automatically conduct a security token transaction on PolyMesh? And so cross-chain atomic transfers are actually really exciting to us um, because that can expand the PolyMesh reach where PolyMesh becomes known and becomes used as the base layer infrastructure for settlement for financial securities. And all these other chains can do all the other stuff. Right, like they can do the the gaming uh, stuff, they can do the uh, cash, they can do uh, whatever, and we specifically focus on security settlement. So that's something that's pretty interesting. Uh, we've made some solid progress uh, with financial infrastructure providers to expand the network, uh, and then NFT season. Uh, if you haven't seen NFT season uh, coming very soon, uh, sign up to our newsletter, polymesh dot network uh, slash subscribe uh, to get on our newsletter. Um, and mainly with NFT season, what we're hoping for there. One is, of course, more assets on chain, uh, getting people uh, using PolyMesh, creating some kind of NFTs. You know, someone might create an NFT of their house, even there. Someone might create an NFT, uh, and it might just be a collection of, you know, monkey JPEGs or whatever the case may be. But we're just excited to see more assets on chain. Um, but mainly what we're looking for there is improvements around our dev portal. Um, so helping community members and people who are interested in PolyMesh going from zero to one, being able to build on PolyMesh very quickly. Um, and really sprucing up what our dev portal looks like and all that tooling. Putting yourself in the position of a financial institution, what is missing from the platform? What would you want to see to create a use case for this? An exchange, liquidity, more tools? I, I think the one thing is, is just more assets on chain, right? Like I keep saying that bigger TVL, in, big institutions want to see smaller institutions and smaller projects go well over a long period of time, right? And so with BlackRock, they used Ethereum uh, for, for their Biddle fund, for example, right? And, you know, they could ask Securitize, hey, what blockchain should we use? But ultimately, BlackRock's going to have a choice and a decision in that matter. And so, you know, Ethereum's the longest running blockchain. It has the highest TVL. It has the most activity. It has the most tokenizations that have taken place in the past. Um, and so, you know, that's where BlackRock decided to deploy their first fund, right? But I think it's important to note that's where they put their first fund, not necessarily their second, fifth, tenth, hundredth. Um, but so uh, just the one main thing we want to see on PolyMesh for that, for financial institutions to get more interested is more users, more tokenizations, more assets on chain. Uh, a few questions about stable coins. Well, so how will Stably's token be used within the platform? Um, and so on PolyMesh, you know, you can use Stably right now. You can go use USDS, you can go to Stably, you can mint USDS on PolyMesh, and then you can use it in a settlement transaction where perhaps one thing with NFT season is, who collects the most NFTs. So if maybe someone wants to trade uh, their NFT against USDS, someone could go mint USDS and trade for an NFT. You know, maybe that's like a certain amount of points in the NFT system or something like that. You know, don't hold me to that. I'm just you know speaking off the cuff here. Uh, but some things that we've been thinking about is is uh, for NFT season specifically, that's where something where USDS could come in handy uh, pretty clearly. Um, the other thing is transactions for securities can settle against USDS. Um, we still don't see a huge amount of institutional buy-in using stable coins. Um, just still some regulatory hurdles, regulatory question marks that they're concerned about. And so we still see them wanting to use cash. Um, but we do see smaller companies, you know, crowdfunding platforms, um, decentralized exchanges. Those kinds of companies are comfortable using stable coins, um, settling against securities. And so that's something where we can see USDS being pretty useful. Why isn't PolyMesh creating a stable coin of its own? Wouldn't you want to have control of this feature within the ecosystem you're creating, not to mention create income from it? And so 
Yes. I mean, that would be nice, but it's an entirely different business, right? There's so many licenses you have to get. You potentially have to get money uh, service businesses licenses in every single U.S. state, every country that you operate in. Um, just doing all that kind of stuff. It's a completely different business. Um, that's not really where our strengths lie. Um, we need to remain very steadfast and focused on our core competency, which is building a layer one blockchain for real world assets. That's what we do. That's what we have to focus on if we decide... Hey, we also uh, build stable coins. Um, you know, it's really hard to do. It's really hard to do one thing well. Um, but when you start branching out, you know, trying to do two, three, four, five things well, um, that's that's where you can get run into some problems. And so, uh, last last uh, category we have here is marketing uh, slash community stuff. Let me check the uh, YouTube here. Um, yeah, Cream Curtis. Yeah, I hear that. Yeah, anybody, any final questions on YouTube? Please go ask them right now. I'll check after these uh, these couple questions, uh, or else we'll call it a day. Uh, what was the feedback from the DAS presentation? So the Digital Asset Summit. Uh, it was great. Um, so I mentioned earlier during the AMA the points from the Bank of International Settlements, where they have those capital requirements and they're very concerned about permissionless blockchains and especially. Um, for ones where third parties are relied upon heavily, Spe specifically as we read that, smart contracts and third party validators. Um, so that was a really good talking point um, that a lot of people latched onto. Um, so, you know, we spoke to a bunch of different institutions, um, biggest ones in the world. And that was something that, you know, some of them had not even really thought about because they were so early in their tokenization journey. They weren't even thinking about, well, what happens when more than 2% of my assets um, are tokenized they because they were only thinking about proofs of concept and having you know one percent of their assets tokenized. But once you get over two percent with a capital two asset, you know your capital requirements change. Everything about your whole business changes. You run into potential uh, risks with the with the regulator as well. So that that was a really good point. I'm glad that that uh, I touched on that in the presentation. Can the grants program be leveraged to enlist Polymesh brand ambassadors? Uh, yes, absolutely. And so the grants. Program is public, you know, it's available. Um, it's mostly tech focused right now, but anyone can go and apply. Go apply for a grant. Tell me what you're going to do. Tell the team what you're going to do. And so, um, you know, like a lot of things in the startup world, like I, I love talking about how Francis joined the Polymesh Association. He was just a guy in Telegram and then in Discord who was just really excited about the project and he helped us out a couple of times. He, you know, said, hey, here's a bug in your code. Great, thanks. He, I eventually said, hey, you need to ban this person from Telegram. They're spamming. Okay, great. I eventually gave him admin access to Telegram. I gave him admin access to, to Discord and he kept helping out and he just wouldn't stop helping out until one day I said, okay, like we have to hire this guy. He's amazing. He loves the project. He works really hard. And so that's how Francis started working at the Polymer Association. You know, Secure Networker, second guy, you know, maybe one day we have to hire Secure. Like he's helping out all the time in the Discord. Um, and so, you know, go make something happen. Um, I don't think we will say, you know, create a grants program where we say, um, if you get a hundred likes on a post, we give you 10 poly extras like that. I, I don't know if we'll do that. I know another, a lot of other projects have done things like that. Um, I don't know how I feel about that. I and mean, that, that stuff takes a lot of time to manage. Um, I can quickly get out of control. And also there's a huge problem with bots and things like that, where someone just, you know, spends a hundred dollars on a bot to get 200 uh, or to get 400 poly extra or something like that. And so I, I think, the idea here is go make stuff happen in the real world and then tell us about it. Um, apply for a grant. Say, this is what I'm going to do. Will you give me poly export? And, you know, then definitely let's talk about it. Uh, similar question. Would lead creation be considered ecosystem development? Uh, can community members be compensated, for example, for introducing a financial institution who brings operating node, introducing new exchange listings to the team or facilitating developers? Um, yeah. So again, you know, go make something happen. Um, if you introduce us to, you know, a, a bank we hadn't heard of um, in uh, in a jurisdiction we hadn't been to before, um, and they end up deploying, you know, $100 million asset on Polymesh, absolutely happy to, you know, um, talk about, you know, thanks for thanks for doing that. Um, I don't know if we'll have any kind of specific program um, for something like that. Um, but yeah, absolutely. If you help out the Polymesh Association, if you help out the Polymesh blockchain, if, if you are helping onboard users, if you are helping us squash bugs, if you are suggesting new features that we're going to use, if you are introducing us to people who end up being beneficial, you know, absolutely happy to, to, to see what might make sense there. Why aren't we seeing, <laughs> this is the final question. Why aren't we seeing more interviews with you and the team on podcasts and videos? Um, and so I read this and I was like kind of confused. So in, in Q1, so in like last couple months, 
Um, I've been on Market Watch twice uh, as a BlockWorks. I was on Real Vision. Um, you know, I'm a Forbes contributor. I, I put two articles out on Forbes. I think uh, November, December last year. Um, I'm planning a new Forbes, Forbes article right now, actually. Um, so you know, I think we are doing a pretty good job in terms of getting visibility to the project, uh, getting into into kind of mainstream press. Um, and so one question I do have that I'd love to see, maybe in YouTube, maybe in Discord, probably preferably in Discord, is is what podcast do you want to see us on? Um, what are the Meshi Mafia's favorite podcasts? Who can we go talk to? Who do you think we should get in front of uh, to help pe- more people learn about Polymesh? You know, always happy to see uh, ways that we can help push P uh, to the broader community and, and bring more people into the world. I see Adam uh, tossed up a hand on YouTube. That's great. Um, secure, there's always McDonald's. <laughs> yes, of course. Uh, McDonald's is a great uh, employee for sure. Maybe we can tokenize some burgers at some point in time. Um, okay, yeah, I think we'll uh, we'll call it a day there. Um, 46 minutes, great time. Again, thank you everybody in the Meshi Mafia uh, for all the great questions. You aren't officially in the Meshi Mafia though, unless you subscribe to YouTube. Uh, you like this video, you follow us on X, and you join the Discord. Um, then you're in the Meshi Mafia, um, and you're one of us. Uh, Google gobble one of us. Uh, but yeah, thanks everybody again. We'll uh, we'll call it a day, and uh, let's keep pushing P and uh, keep uh, some more assets coming onto the blockchain. Have a good day, everybody.